<laughs> Not designed to operate at the cruising altitude of a 747, huh, Jason Clark? It's more like the cruising altitude of a 727. Shows what you know. <laughs> oh, wow, it is. It's really been too long since I've done this. And this is movie night. Hello and welcome to the seventh season of Movie Night. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. It is great to be back after a long summer hiatus, but I've made some changes to the show while I was away, both major and cosmetic. But let's get to tonight's reviews. We'll be taking a look at some mountain climbing movies in honor of the worldwide release of Everest. As always, we begin with the oldest of the collection with my thoughts on Vertical Limit. Martin Campbell, the man who brought us Goldeneye, Green Lantern, and Casino Royale, directs this action thriller that nearly tripled its $75 million budget. Despite being released in December of 2000, this 124 minute feature feels fresh out of the 90s. There's a certain quaintness and unrestrained fun from action films of that era, back when movies mix chaotic excitement with unbelievable stunts. Nowadays, filmmakers strive for realism and grittiness over the flashy explosions of yesteryear. In the wake of 9-11, I understand the reasoning behind this broader thematic shift. The world was a darker, scarier, more uncertain place, but damn do I miss the carefree nonsense movies like Vertical Limit brought to the screen. So when I say this PG-13 rated survival flick feels like a cheesy 90s adventure, that is absolutely a compliment. I mean, a major plot device in this picture are unstable canisters of explosive nitroglycerin. Our intrepid hikers foolishly lug up the world's most dangerous mountain. In between these gratuitous explosions, the narrative sees Chris O'Donnell leading a group of daring mountain climbers to the top of K2 in search of his missing sister. The large cast of familiar faces includes the cute but resourceful Robin Tooney, Scott Glenn as a mysterious and scary mountain man, and Bill Paxson as a cocksure thrill seeker who goads a cautious companion by rudely reminding him of the mountain. I mean, did you really think she was going to lift up her skirt and pull her panties down? Former Bond girl Isabella Scoriupo and Star Trek alum Alexander Siddig also portray fellow climbers. The acting from this core group remains believable in even the most harrowing situations, which has our protagonist dangling from cliffs and ledges on an eye rolling four separate occasions. The premise of their rescue mission is to ascend the world's harshest peak as quick as possible, but nearly every time we check on their progress, they're sitting around and delivering speeches to one another. There are great set pieces and stunt work here, and the movie effortlessly pivots from one to the next, but the real highlight is a stunningly powerful cold open set above Utah's Monument Valley. It's a nail-biting and emotional sequence that forces O'Donnell to make a critical life-or-death decision. This five-minute prologue is so profoundly intense, it honestly makes the remainder of the picture a disappointment, especially since the next half hour is devoted entirely to character introductions. Commendably, the quickly paced movie is photographed on location at various mountain ranges around the world, lending much-needed realism to the ridiculous story. Some of the more impossible scenarios were obviously accomplished with chroma-keyed backgrounds and effects, but even for its age, they look surprisingly solid. James Newton Howard's forgetful score blends woodwinds and heavy drums to give the picture a somewhat Pakistani sound. Falling victim to several tropes and predictable twists and a few too many dumb decisions, this is a movie many might dismiss, but if you want shallow popcorn entertainment with death-defying heroics and grossly negligent rock climbing techniques, you can't go wrong with Vertical Limit. It's a movie I bought on VHS way back in 2001 and has been a guilty pleasure of mine ever since. I'll rate this a 7 out of 10. Next up, Touching the Void. A movie The Guardian described as the most successful documentary in British cinema history, this 106-minute film earned over four times its $3 million budget after its December release in 2003. Directed by Kevin MacDonald and based on the book of the same name, the R-rated survival drama shares the incredible real-life account of two mountain climbers whose near-fatal climb of Sulia Grande in the Andes Mountains using a never-before-taken route led to disaster. Told via surprisingly authentic, dramatized reenactments that are narrated by present-day interviews, British friends Joe Simpson and Simon Yates recount their respective experiences of one remarkable fight for survival. When Joe falls during their descent and badly breaks his leg, the two struggle to get him down the mountain safely, before Simon ultimately is forced to leave him for dead. 
But what is accomplished next is such a remarkable and inspiring tale, it's impossible not to be captivated by their story. Although these unbelievable events did take place in 1985, the grown men are still visibly affected by their relationship and emotions some 18 years later. Perhaps the most powerful scene is when the men are initially separated. Simon attempts to lower Joe's injured body hundreds of feet beneath a blind ledge, but a loud storm prevents them from hearing one another, resulting in a dreadful situation where Simon is forced to make a life or death decision without knowing the position or condition of his partner. These moments immediately make you reflect on how you'd handle something like this. Do you assume he's lost and cut the rope, or hope for the best and attempt another rescue? As for Joe, he laments in his own words, there was nothing I could do, so I just hung on the rope and waited to die. My hands were cold, my feet were cold. You know, I was very, very cold. And of course, you, you sat there and you don't warm up. It was a desperate position. Made worse for the fact I had no idea, you know, what Joe was doing or what position he was in. And I, I just couldn't figure out why it, it was taking him so long to get his weight off the rope. You know, there was no sensible explanation for it. Although they rarely speak their own dialogue, Brendan McKay and Nicholas Aaron portray the protagonist during the flashback footage as glorified body doubles. It's a thankless job, but the two do tremendous work with it, all of which stays rather faithful to climbing techniques and real events. Obviously, there's no twist ending here. We know how this story is going to end by virtue of Joe's very existence, but hearing how this achievement of human perseverance was accomplished can't be overstated. Traditional sound effects and a fitting score from Alex Hefts help break the monotony of the talking heads, and at 106 minutes, the movie is paced rather well. One of the most gripping documentaries I've ever watched, and certainly the most fascinating rock climbing related movie, Touching the Void is a distressing but honest account of incredible courage. I thought it was a great film. Rounding out our trilogy of climbing movies, let's review Everest. This disaster adventure film from Icelandic director Baltasar Kumrakau was released worldwide on September 18th, 2015, where it quickly doubled its $50 million budget. Based on the real events of the 1996 Mount Everest disaster, the PG-13 rated story focuses on the survival attempts of two separate expedition groups who are trapped by a monster storm in the so-called death zone, described by one character as an area where their bodies will be literally dying. The film's all-star cast features five Oscar nominees, including Jason Clark, Josh Brolin, John Hawks, Robin Wright, Emily Watson, Michael Kelly, Sam Worthington, Kira Knightley, and Jake Gyllenhaal. They all contribute great performances, especially Knightley, who portrays the grieving and helpless wife. But with the exception of Clark, who could best be described as the picture's only real lead character, no one receives enough screen time to really make a lasting impact. Worthington and Gyllenhaal are practically reduced to extras. This is the real downfall of Everest. The harrowing events only work if there's an emotional connection to the characters. And with the exception of Hawks' character, we don't learn much behind their death-defying motivation to climb the world's tallest mountain. Answering a probing inquiry from journalist John Krakauer, whose account of the disaster would become a future bestseller, Hawks confesses his own reasons for attempting the summit. He hopes to set an example as an average guy and inspire school kids back in his hometown. It's a strong and inspirational moment, but without spoiling much, we really don't get a satisfying conclusion to his story. Adhering closely to historical accuracy like this is certainly commendable, but it doesn't always result in an exciting payoff. Basically, this picture has the exact opposite problem Vertical Limit does. A measured compromise between their respective techniques would likely improve both films. No, I'm not leaving you behind, Doug. Come on. Got him, right? No, Doug, come on, come on with me. I need 10 good minutes, Doc. Come on! Please, Nicky, come on, mate. 10 minutes. We get to the bottom of the step. Oh, this leg. This leg, Dougie. Come on. Come on. Oh, there we go. I saw a 3D screening of Everest in the new IMAX laser format and I posted a full review of this new projection system and why you should absolutely pay the extra money to see it to my second channel. But suffice it to say, the picture quality is breathtakingly beautiful, amazingly lifelike, and easily the best looking image I've ever seen. I was so impressed by how good this film looked, I'm willing to overlook some of the flaws with story and pacing. Even on a smaller 2D format though, the visuals and cinematography here are downright gorgeous. It makes me want to take up rock climbing again and fly to Nepal right now. How they accomplish these visuals is anyone's guess, because the effects were so seamless, these million dollar movie stars may very well have been stuck on a mountain at 27,000 feet. Paced a bit slowly at 121 minutes, and far less effective than Krakauer's source novel, Into Thin Air, there's still an engaging and well-made picture here. Demonstrating the power of human spirit, as well as our foolish naivety, this is something everyone can connect with. For mountain climbing enthusiasts and those fascinated by a true tragic story, Everest is a gripping experience told with detrimental accuracy. I thought it was cool. 
Unfortunately, that does it for tonight's episode, but here's what we'll be discussing next time if you'd like to leave a comment review. And if you click this information icon, some related videos will slide out for you to watch. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching, and have a good movie night. Thank you.